lot of these conference speeches, um, and uh, one of the, the things that uh, a lot of folks have asked me recently, folks from Speed Invest have asked me, is can, we, can you talk about some of the lessons learned from scaling Uber? Um, and I was actually pretty reticent to do it, to be honest, because I made a TV show about Uber. Um, and, and despite its lack of accuracy, uh, you know, I, I thought it was a bit of a dead topic. Um, but, but I guess the, the reason I went through this exercise was I felt like I got this question a lot from founders and, and people um, in our ecosystem who really wanted to learn like the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's the intent of this. I won't be offended if you have uh, you know, testing questions and very happy to answer them. I think there's a lot of really positive things um, from the experience. I think there's also, you know, like any experience, um, some things that, uh, you know, that could have gone better or, or we could have done um, differently. Uh, cool. So this is a bit about me. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, um, uh, born and raised in the Bay Area. My parents are engineers. My mom is a software developer. It's just kind of the world I grew up around. Uh, I, I just kind of thought that was, you know, normal. And so like a lot of people, uh, you want to get away from what you grew up around, right? And so for me, it was no different. And I went into uh, consulting, and that was pretty boring. Um, I ended up uh, at Intuit uh, pretty early on in my career, working on various uh, product launches as a PM. And, and for me, that was a really formative um, experience because uh, effectively what I learned from that experience was it, it was it was really all about customer experience, right? And, and customer experience and product was really the defining characteristic of the company's trajectory and its um, focus. Um, Intuit was a wonderful place, uh, except it was a big company and it was slow. And this was late 2011 in San Francisco. Everybody was going to join the next wave of, of startups. Um, and so I made a list of the five companies I thought were most interesting in San Francisco at the time. Uh, Uber was at the top of the list. I sort of linked in, hustled my way to a, um, an intro to one of the recruiters, which was probably the luckiest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, um, and joined Uber early in 2012 as one of the first 100 employees there um, globally. Um, uh, ended up uh, leading Uber's international expansion team, grossly unqualified to do that job. Uh, then, then ran Uber's uh, business in emerging markets, again, also grossly unqualified to do that job. Uh, and then in 2016, was asked to lead uh, Uber's expansion into food delivery. Uh, again, knew nothing about food delivery, grossly unqualified to do that job. Um, and now uh, I, I work at Omer's Ventures as part of the um, uh, investment team here in Europe. Again, grossly unqualified uh, to do that job. So you, you sense a theme here. Um, this was the team that, that I worked with um, in the middle of 2013 to help get Uber started in India. This is in Bangalore. Um, you know, it was four or five people. It was a tight group, extremely communicative. Um, it was very clear what we were trying to achieve, start Uber in India. Um, and this was the team I was managing 15 months later. I think I was, I think I was 26 at the time, right? Was, was so unprepared. Uh, uh, to, to take on this challenge. And I guess I kind of learned by doing, right? It was, um, for me, the, the experience was defined by the ability to get a large and diverse group of people across, at this point, I think it was 26 countries to move towards uh, a shared goal um, and, and vision. Uh, I guess the, the, the key questions that I, that I look back on and reflect on are, uh, we'll start with the positives and, and obviously, uh, give, given, the, given the, the conversation, always also you know, talk about the things that could have gone better. Um, if I look back at, at the early years in particular, from, from zero to you know, the, the initial, let's call it four-year exercise, um, there were three things that really drove the company's success. These are the three things, and, and I'll, I'll go into them. Um, in a little bit more detail. I guess the first is really around mission, right? I guess a question I would ask yourselves in, in all of the companies that, um, you know, that you operate is, are you very clear about what you're trying to achieve and the mission that you and your teams are, are focused on? At Uber, every day, every member of our team was, was really focused on this mission, make transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. And, it was very clear, even in the noise and, and, and in the challenges and adversity, that that's what we were trying to achieve. Um, and, and it's actually um, interesting to me, particularly now as an early stage 
you know, investor, how much asking this question can really give you a sense of someone's ambition? And I think in the companies that you all are running, for th this is the first question I'd be asking, right? On a, on a, on a, on a, um, on, at a formative um, level. That mission really drove and motivated every decision we made. Um, and it led to a really important principle, which is fierce internal debate. And I think this is um, a premise that is often overlooked um, and a really important part of building early stage companies. I think if you're not able to have that internal debate, like what are we all doing here, right? Um, that's, I think, how you really can build generational products, technologies, and, and customer experiences. Um, this is why this mission point matters. Because it was such a mission-driven organization, people gave everything to the company. Right? Just the grit, determination, hours, it was non-negotiable. Because if you, if you didn't believe in it, you weren't prepared to make the commitment. And it was just as simple as that. And it wasn't for everybody, and that's totally OK. But the commitment was what was required to build, particularly at the stage that um, the company was at that point. Um, this is kind of saying the same thing, but you know, I, I see, I saw some friends and colleagues from Uber over the last two days here, and you see them now, and everybody looks younger, even though it was five years later, which is, I think, I guess that's what that point says. Um, the last thing I will say is ownership, and this is an interesting point in a variety of contexts, particularly in Europe. Ownership, to me, is, is kind of defined on two fronts, right? One is your ability to influence and be responsible for the outcome, but the second is actual financial ownership. And in 2012 at Uber, one of the rules that we had was every person at the company, from junior to senior, from uh, you know, entry level in San Francisco to senior engineer in Amsterdam, every person had equity. And, and what it forced you to do when you were able to say that, and, and at this point that wasn't in vogue, right? Because people didn't value equity, some people didn't understand how, 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 it, how it impacted their compensation, but it, it allowed us to ensure that everyone at the company knew that they were an owner of the company. And, and skin in the game, or whatever you want to call it now, um, is a really powerful motivating tool for, um, for, for teams. It allowed everybody to, f to feel at that stage like it was their company, their uh, business. Um, I think the second big lesson is this idea of impact of empowered teams. And the second part, I think, is the important part, regardless of seniority. I, I think it's very easy to create a culture where senior people feel comfortable to speak up and shout and junior people feel like they may not be qualified to do that. But the best ideas at Uber came from the junior members of the team because they were the ones that were closest to the market, closest to the dynamics, closest to the, in our case, the riders, the drivers, the restaurants, sensing and feeling what was really going on. And that's one piece of it because lots of companies have observations. But how do you create a culture where people are actually empowered to take those insights and turn them into product recommendations and decisions. This is a, a great example of that. In 2016, we launched cash payments at Uber. This was first in Kenya and then across Africa and India as well. And in 2012 in San Francisco when Uber started, you know, seamless cashless payment was the, basically the premise of the company, right? And you know, we start expanding internationally in San Francisco or London where you take for granted paying for your, I guess at that point, $2 Starbucks, now $6 Starbucks um, with your credit card. And then you go to Kenya, I remember, I'll never forget, I remember looking at the conversion funnel from sign up, from, from download to sign up in Kenya. And it was uh, for 100 people who attempted the sign up funnel, sign up flow one successfully made it through. And I remember looking at that going, like, this, doesn't, this doesn't seem very good. Um, and there were a bunch of reasons for that, right? You, like, you needed a foreign credit card to sign up for Uber. Like, absolute mess, right? And so what we realized was 
there was always going to have to be a, a point where we considered this. But it was really our local team on the ground in places like Kenya and India and Lebanon who were sort of shouting for um, you know, this. And we basically uh, we were able to challenge one of the non-negotiables of the founding of the company, right? which is a pretty amazing exercise if you think about it. Now, it was incredibly experimental, merit and data-driven performance oriented. I think in the last public filing, Uber said something like 54% of global signups now are not with credit cards. So um, the reason that this happened was a very um, insightful, empowered, and in some cases loud uh, team that was able to raise this issue. The other point that's really interesting about the story is from the day that this experiment was proposed to the day it was launched was 40 days, right? which is pretty amazing if you think about reorienting your entire product and technology experience to support an experiment like this. Um, and then the third thing, this is kind of obvious, so I, won't, I won't go too, too deep here, is just this idea of, 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 of highly scalable product and technology and deep investment in its uh, sustainability and scalability. Many of you who you know, run marketplace businesses, you'll know that there's a dependency on both technology and in some ways a physical service or offline component to the business. And I think one of the key empowering things, particularly in Silicon Valley culture, was not treating those two teams like they were any different. That they were not this culture of second class citizens between product and engineering teams and operations teams. And I think that, that mattered a lot, particularly in a distributed and offline business like Google. This is a really interesting point um, that I think highlights that, that scalability question, which is about 30% of Uber's uh, engineering resources went to building internal tools. Which is, which is kind of an interesting uh, a challenge point. But basically what we realized was that the, the ability for the employees and the company to be efficient using off the rack uh, tools um, was extremely impacted by their efficacy. And so in areas like CRM, uh, pricing, uh, Uber actually built home built tools to support the specific instances of that. Now, I think there are limitations to that, right? Like, I don't think you need to try to recreate Zendesk, but um, I think in the early days, a huge part of the value of the, of, um, I would say even the value of the company was defined by these internal tools. And, and I think it's a really interesting question to ask yourselves in the construct of product and engineering, because I think our first natural inclination is to go and build customer facing infrastructure related items, which are great but um, internal tools were a huge part of the competitive advantage we built. All right, what went wrong? Obviously, I think probably what's more interesting. Um, I, I, I try to summarize these things in four areas. Uh, distributed team without clear values, speaking truth to power, uh, balance, particularly in marketplace businesses, and building diverse teams from the start. Okay. Um, Uber was a very distributed company, had employees, I think, in 65 countries uh, when I left, teams on the ground in most of those countries, large product tech GNA organization in San Francisco, smaller ones in Amsterdam um, as well. Wait. Okay. Um, each senior leader at Uber, there are 10 of us who were regional general managers who ran global regions and parts of the P&L, um, we had large teams, right? Several hundred people, and people, ha people would ask what we stood for. And so in a, I don't know, I guess a very McKinsey way, we all came up with our own values. And um, those were, you know, I would say non-offensive values that many companies would have. But this actually happened before Uber as a company defined its values. Uber as a company goes through this exercise of values in 2015, five years after the company was founded. That scene actually was in the TV show, 
based on uh, based on uh, based on my memory. Um, and so you end up in the scenario where the company values kind of happened, and there were so many conflicting definitions between the values that the team had been working with for the last couple of years, and the values that the company had set. And there were there were 14 corporate values, which is a lot, um, as well. I guess the point of this exercise, actually, very sim the point of this is just a very simple sentence, which is, I don't think at any point it's too early to define the values of your company. And they can be iterative, and they can change, and you can have a debate about them. But I think the premise of what you stand for is super important, because I think it is the uh, absolute um, uh, driving force behind culture and tone. And I think a lot of what went wrong Uber at Uber was a lack of clarity about what we stood for because you were running a part of the business, I was running a part of the business. We had different circumstances, different countries, different opposition, and so we would conform to the environment we were in, even if those two things were as uh, were in direct conflict with each other. Um, and it was magnified because of how kind of globally uh, distributed the business was. Um, sp speaking truth to power, I think, is probably the, the most important um, thing that I, that I learned and uh, I think went wrong. The premise of this is really simple, right? Which is regardless of who you are, your seniority, you want to create a culture where people feel empowered to share issues, challenges, problems that they have. And I think at Uber, people, people got to a point, particularly in that period that you know, was, was very intense in 2016 and 17, where people were afraid to do that. And I think if you, if you create a culture where people are afraid to speak truth to power, particularly at the, if you're a CEO of a company and your leadership team is afraid to do that, and you end up creating a culture of yes men and yes women, I think that is the beginning of the end. Uh, a, a second key point of this is this isn't just about quote like business topics, right? This isn't just about a product release or country strategy. This is about how you as a company operate. Are there people working here that shouldn't be working here anymore? How do we do things like performance management and promotions? Are we being transparent about communication? How do we improve um, the diversity of our team? I, 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 I genuinely feel like this moment was um, a lot of it was inspired by, it, by fear of disappointment. So you ended up in this situation where people didn't want to communicate disappointment, didn't want to communicate how um, challenging a particular situation was because they wanted to just kind of deal with it and handle it themselves. And for me, I think this moment is one you can point to um, to, to, I, to, to sort of, you see it as a pivot point of where things uh, were challenging. Um, I think the, the, the interesting thing about leadership, right, is it's two ways, right? You're, you're managing up and you're managing a team. And I think creating a culture of empowerment in startups is often talked about. But I think a question is how does that empowerment evolve as the company scales, right? We went from 1,500 to 10,000 people in 18 months. And so how, how do you create that culture of empowerment and communication? And I think this idea of absolute clarity and truth in that communication um, is, is a key part of what I see great companies and great leaders continue to um, do. Um, marketplace businesses balance matters, right? Many of you run marketplaces. First question people ask you is, is it a supply-constrained marketplace or demand-constrained marketplace? What are the dynamics around uh, take rate, how do you manage quality control? All fair questions. I think the key question for Uber in the early days was an extremely supply constrained marketplace. Right? You're creating this market, creating this environment. Um, and so because it was supply constrained, we over indexed on supply growth. But the supply constraint, as drivers realized how much money they could potentially make on the platform, it actually kind of went away. Not because we didn't need to continually drive, uh, uh, increase the number of drivers on the platform, but because it didn't seem like a huge structural challenge. We needed, uh, so, so the mistake that I think we made was we aired 
too frequently in these marketplace debates that I'm sure many of you will have on the side of the riders, not the drivers. We needed driver advocates earlier in our cycle, healthier um, defense of driver NPS um, and earnings and product and operations and support. And I think we became a bit blinded towards only being focused on one side. And if you think about Lyft, the like main competitor in the US, actually I think this point is actually the main reason why I think Lyft even exists, right? Which is that it's built a very similar product, but really took, uh, would you say, driver uh, needs, wants, and NPS into account in everything they did. And the consequence of that, um, extremely significant. I think we were just too quick to default to the side of riders. I would include a note about regulators here too. This is a whole other conversation, not necessarily um, a, a, a super productive one because I think there are still a lot of differing views on that. Um, but I think we, we, we were disrupting a particularly regulated industry and for me that um, the ability to manage a diverse range of constituents I think is particularly, I think it's a fair question to ask. Uh, and then I think the, the other point is, is around diversity of teams. And I think it's, it's a bit the point Julian made today in his, in his talk this morning. I think when you're at hyperscale, you're just trying to keep up. You're just trying to keep your head above the waterline. And I think we weren't very purposeful about uh, diversity in, in hiring. Um, you know, the, the, the team that I ran, the Emerging Markets team that I ran, seven of our 16 GMs were women. In Uber Eats, it was just two of 13. And that was after the fact. It wasn't any different, any less purposeful, any uh, worse intent. It was just that the pressure in the system, I think, didn't create the right behaviors and incentives for us to think about diversity there. A great story, John Boo. That's all wonderful. I did watch the TV show. Um, what does this mean, right? And I think uh, what I've tried to do here is extrapolate some of those lessons that to, to questions you can ask yourself in the construct of the businesses that um, you're all running. And as I said, after this, I'm super happy to answer any questions. Please don't be shy and, and nothing off limits. I think the first thing I learned from, from that experience, you know, the, 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 the moving from the, the, this, moving from the first photo to the second, the five to the 200 person team was, I think a question of if you're, if you're actually scaling yourself and are you as a leader exposing yourself to individuals, support, infrastructure to manage that scale and growth? I, I think for me, the places I would go that I, I didn't at that time, but I, but I wish I had, were one, peers, and finding a really good group of peers in similar stages or similar sectors um, that you could just kind of vent a bit with because I think actually having that conversation is really helpful and, and relieving. The second is finding really trusted advisors. I'm a big fan of, of coaches for founders. I understand that's expensive, but it may be informal. It may be an investor, a board member, an angel investor, um, a, a founder who's exited or, or, or a bit later stage than you. I think most of the mistakes that I made from a leadership perspective were simply because I was just unaware unaware of myself, unaware of my own limitations. We were doing whatever, once a year, upward feedback surveys. Once a year is an eternity in a hyper-growth company. The second is keep your sanity. Right? Running a business is, is tough. It's lonely, it's intense, pressure uh, is high. Felix, just before this, was talking about sleepless nights and consequences of, hey, people have invested in a business A and now I'm running a completely different business and how are they gonna handle it? I think it's important to have your red lines. What is non-negotiable for you that you need to do? That could be time with your family, that could be your fitness class on Thursday evenings, that could be one Sunday a month where you don't look at your phone. And I understand this is, this is not perfect, right? Uh, you've invested so much financially and in terms of time in the businesses that you've built. So it's hard to structure that. But I actually think for me, a huge part of why I left Uber in 2018 after six wonderful but very, very intense years was I, I'd just done a really crap job of this and not managed um, to keep my own sanity through that very intense period. I saw somebody I hadn't seen in a long time uh, this morning and, and he said, you look like you've got a huge weight off your shoulders. And I said, no, I actually have got a physically 
I'm, I've got, I'm, I weigh physically a lot less than when I last saw you, um, <laughs> which, which is maybe a, maybe a point. Define your values. I talked about this. I, I think this is a, this is a half day exercise at an early stage company. Just do it. Just do it. Um, and make sure that it's relevant to you. Make sure as you go through this scale, um, you're revisiting these things. Uh, culture carries an interesting point. Basically, one of the things that mattered a lot in the construct of a business that was internationalizing very fast was as you expanded either to new geographies, new offices, new customers, new industries, was that you had to rely on your team to do much of the coaching and growth of new members of the team, right? Because you couldn't do that all yourself. And so the premise that we created was this idea of a culture carrier. There was somebody who were um, perfectly representative of the culture that we wanted to build in a new office, a new country, a new industry, new customer base. And those, customer, uh, those culture carriers um, were high performers, people who really believed and loved the company, who committed a lot to it. And when we opened a new office or new vertical, they were the first people we sent over to really help everybody else in that office or in that, um, in that business line understand what does it mean to work at this company? What should it feel like? What is the intensity that we need to bring? What is the, what is the um, ambition that we all have? And when you've got these great ambitious people and you give them an opportunity to go do this, it's also a great thing for them, right? Hey, go spend three months in Japan is a really cool pitch for somebody who's a really high performer. But this idea of, of um, who are the people in your company when you say this is what it means to work at Refurbed, uh, that's a really powerful question to answer and I really encourage you all to, to ask that question. And use those people for things like uh, selling candidates, for um, interviews, for PR and press, because they are really the ones who, who embody that and it can show everybody that you know, there's more to what you're doing than just you. Um, I think so much of scaling leadership is about hiring and the people you choose to bring in. Um, and I guess the simple takeaway from the Uber experience on hiring was, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think it's very easy to sit in an interview and say, what did you do? Where did you work? Oh, Goldman Sachs, that's great. Um, tell me about your leadership philosophy. Like, it's all cool, but it's pretty uncontroversial. It's really hard to understand who is somebody, what did they do, how will they fit, what is their capability, what is their ambition. And so at Uber, there were really only two things we did when interviewing people. One was <coughs> um, focusing the interview process on what I would call replicating what the job actually would be. So uh, if we're hiring you to be a pricing analyst, Here's an exercise of pricing. Just go do the exercise. Recommend how you would price the product. You're a uh, transaction lawyer, here's a contract, mark it up. And that was actually a huge component of, of the recruitment process and, and for me was invaluable in figuring out who actually could do the job. <coughs> Even if their credentials and capabilities were you know, not from um, wherever. The, the second point of this that, um, that I found was really critical was um, in the construct of your hiring process, figure out who are the individuals that you can rely on who can now, um, who can now amplify its efficacy. And this is kind of from the Amazon principle of bar raisers but the idea being that there's somebody in the interview panel who's not an expert on the functionality of the role, but an expert on the culture of the company. And that person is heavily involved in the process of determining who, who is the individual that, that we should bring in. And this is the last one, most important one, hardest one. I think some of the biggest mistakes I've seen from early stage companies has been on mishiring. And that's fine, we're all gonna mishire from time to time, it happens. <coughs> I think the great structural mistake is just not making a decision about if that person's the right fit fast enough. 
if you've got 24 months of runway and you just wasted nine months with the wrong senior hire, that's a death knell for the company. And so uh, a really deep understanding, sorry, a really deep understanding of, of that is important. Sorry, one last point on refining your hiring process. The, the thing I cannot recommend enough that was really critical for us was referencing. Amazing to me how few people are referencing. Not just references that the candidates tell you, but do a bit of LinkedIn work, talk to people who worked at the company, and really understand what they did. This isn't about personality referencing, because I think it's easy to say, oh, I talked to this person who worked at that company, they liked this person. No. What was the actual job? Who did this? Success has many, uh, you know, has many people that claim it. Failure has, has very few. Um, it's, it's still amazing to me now when I get reference calls for people that worked with at Uber, how many people take credit for things they had nothing to do with. Incredible, right? Uh, I, 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 a company once called me and they said, hey, it's been a while since we talked to you. Uh, I said, oh, yeah, how's everything going? They said, yeah, we hired this person to be head of international expansion. Uh, it didn't work out, which was really surprising uh, because of their background. I said, what was their background? They said, oh, they were the head of Uber in Africa. And I was like, that's actually funny because that's, that was my job. Um, I'd never heard of this person before. All right, incredible. This is a well-funded Series A startup in London marketplace business. Um, th ho hopefully, hopefully this makes sense. Um, uh, that's, that's what I've got. I'm happy to answer any uh, questions you all may have as well. I think this guy in the black t-shirt raised his hand first. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you for the, call, the talk. Uh, I have a question about, um, like you mentioned that Uber was like disrupting a market, and because of these, like other competitors went into the market and tried to get a uh, different niche. Um, how do you balance the compromise of growing fast versus keeping your values as you grow? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a red line, right? And there are many ways to define the red line, right? What if this news was on the front page of a newspaper? What if this news was, uh, you know, uh, communicated to every member of our team and every investor? You know, how, what, what are the financial consequences of this decision? At the end of the day, startups have to grow. They have to scale. I think there's irony in saying this as a venture capitalist too, but not all companies have to be venture-backed companies, right? Like there are some of the greatest businesses in the world are very profitable. They grow 25% a year. That's an outstanding outcome. Sell it to PE and you probably make a really great out, you know, or, or corporate M&A and you, you make a really great outcome. I think the challenge with the venture ladder is once you get on it, every round you take, the expectations of that lead investor are whatever, 3x, 5x, 10x. And so you end up on this ladder where the path towards doing that is more dilutive capital for you as a founder, which, which isn't always the answer, right? I think um, Uber was very clearly on that venture-backed path. That was the path they want, Uber wanted to go down. And I think the balance between seeing barriers that needed to be overcome and, hey, these are things that are probably not the right thing to do, for sure was not as clear as it should be. The, the last point I'll make about that topic is I think it's, it's, it's very easy to sort of, you've all seen it, right? These startups, you have a startup and you have a financial plan that shows like magic profitability in year X and year X is always the last year in the financial cycle that you've built the plan for. I guess... What I found is that startups are at their scrappiest and most efficient, oftentimes earliest in their cycle. And so, you know, a great example is the marketing transition from highly organic, founder-led referral marketing to a more scalable, let's call it performance marketing strategy. That's not going to be more efficient. So, figuring out what those um, what those levers are and really factoring that into that plan, I think, is important. But I think you know, fine, maybe you've got to raise one round of capital. I get it. Maybe you have to do two. But I think if you're going beyond that, 
I think you have to recognize what the expectations of return for investors are and if that's what you're signing up for. Because I think it does, it does change the game a little bit. So. Actually, a good uh, follow-up question to the previous point, I guess, is more on, on regulation because you only touched on it shortly in the, in the presentation. But basically, it seems like you have a, a very distinct view on whether or not Uber took the right approach. And if I maybe uh, uh, simplify it but drill it down or summarize it somehow, then I would say that they wouldn't care too much about regulation and just go all in in any market and basically disregard whatever local regulation is and then just uh, force the model onto the market, so to say. At least in the very beginning, obviously, that also backfired. Uh, but I, I'd be keen to get your view on this or whether or not you agree or, or what also the thinking behind that was and, yeah. and so on. Uh, <laughs> how, how long do you have? Um, <laughs> I think if you're, if you're going to build a disruptive tech company, you're going to have to be prepared to, to understand the pressures that are going to come at you. I think the thing that we didn't fully understand at Uber in the early days was how political the taxi and transportation sector was. Incredibly political, right? Incredibly uh, money-making for many people, incredibly nefarious around it. Um, I think for sure the, um, the how could have been better, right? I think uh, I'd be the first person to admit that. But I guess the point I come back to is, if we had asked for permission in an extremely opaque, extremely political, extremely uh, um, sort of uh, politically intertwined industry, I, I think not only would we not have built anything of consequence, I think the world would be worse off for it. And the only last example I'll say about this is, you know, Uber's had new CEO, new leadership for five years now. And I remember when that happened and I was still working there. One of the questions at that point was, hey, the new approach, the friendly approach, the government is our friend approach is gonna really unlock South Korea, Japan, Germany and Spain. But like, has it? I don't think so, right? Just objectively. And that's not a criticism. I think that's just a reality. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's how I feel about it is uh, the, the realities of the sector we were operating in and the competitive dynamics. Um, it was never about law breaking or not. I think it was about how does this industry evolve over time and are, are the laws just, right? Many of you are German, you know, in Germany there's this return to garage rule, right? I don't, I don't know what the state of it is. I'm not super close to ride sharing anymore, but you know, effectively what the rule was is if I dropped you off, if I picked you up from here and dropped you off at the Brandenburg airport, I could not pick somebody up at the airport and bring them back to this hotel. I have to go back to my home registered office before I could do that, which is just protectionism, right? So. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing we were up against. And uh, for better or worse, that's the world we were in. And, you know, listen, there were, it was, you know, we talked about resilience and those things. Like, you know, the, the resilience of a team in the political industry is that, where, I mean, people in, you know, people spending nights in jail, people getting beaten up by taxi drivers, people being pepper sprayed for walking down the street, people, having, you know, death threats on Twitter. So, you know, I think it's a little unfair to, to uh, I'm not saying this is what you're doing, but I, I think it's, it's not as a black and white of an issue as I think it's maybe portrayed out to be on, uh, whatever it is, HBO Max, Showtime. Maybe one more? Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, so I was one of the earliest employees of Zomato. So oh, cool. Uh, and I was wondering how the online ordering landscape in India back in 2013, like I think that's around the time when Uber Eats started. In yeah. It. Yeah. So a bit later, it was uh, 15. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's where we came to know. Okay, Uber is going to start this business, so let's start start focusing on it ourselves as well. So how did that determine the trajectory of like how Uber Eats took over? Because 
it, it was a pretty interesting cycle with Swiggy, Zomato, and Uber Eats. And uh, a, a second question, did, uh, did you ever think about cloud kitchens in India, given the newest venture of uh, like Travis, he, he's having fun with them now. But yeah. yeah. Um, so, so very quickly on food delivery. Um, I think many great companies are defined by their second act and their ability to build second large cash flow positive products and platforms. And you look at companies like Google and Stripe and Amazon, it's actually the second act that is the real driving force behind the long-term growth and strategy of the company. Um, so food delivery was one of many experiments that Uber tried in the early days. And I think the premise of it was really around how does the power of the logistical network add value in other categories and sectors? Food was growing, it was fast, it was global. Um, we ran a bunch of experiments and we found success. There were probably 10 failed experiments in everything from pharmacy to parcels to uh, hot food sitting in the back of a car driving around the city and people ordering it in five minutes, right? Uh, sort of like warm sushi in your car, it was not a great um, set up. But, but I think the, the culture of experimentation was important. Uh, kitchens, I mean, yeah, I think kitchens are interesting. I think, um, you know, I think the number I heard was in London, it cost somewhere between 500,000 and a million pounds to outfit, set up, and insure a restaurant, right? Which is pretty crazy when you think about all in leases, etc. If you can get into a cloud kitchen for 2,000 pounds a month, start the business concept, build it on delivery, it kind of seems like a no-brainer, at least a place to start, and then what is, a rest, what is a traditional restaurant? I think it probably becomes a showcase for you know, a brand, and that's what we're seeing. One of, our, um, one of the portfolio companies we've invested in, Deliveract, is an operating system for restaurants to manage their, and food makers to manage you know, many of their, uh, their various digital channels. So um, I think I'm pretty bullish on the category. I guess I just think about it as a real estate business, not necessarily a software business, right? But not everything has to be a software business. Some like interesting software, especially when it comes to like what uh, a cloud kitchen itself is doing as well. So it's yeah. I just I, I guess I think trust is trust is a really important exercise, right? And I think trust is really important um, in the construct of 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 what people are building. And um, I think there are there are plenty of ways to get really great. There's so many great. Uh, software management tools right now for food in various regions and directions. And, and I guess I, I don't fully understand the reason that it needs to be completely coupled with the real estate piece of it. But, you know, listen, this will be, this will come out in the wash, I think. All right, thank you. Thank you.